Hi all, uh, thank you for coming. I'm Rudy Faust. I'm a program manager here at the Shared Use Mobility Center, and I am also the uh, facilitator for the uh, payments and multimodal data integration subgroups that Alvaro had mentioned uh, earlier. We will be mainly, this is the uh, demonstration portion of, of the workshop, so you should be able to see everything on the screen, but the speakers will be based here if you want to see our faces, but I think I can see most of you. And um, got a little wistful, just as uh, the AM, AIM and uh, IMI grants are, are wrapping up. Some, some grantees are now in evaluation, some are uh, uh, have a little bit more to go, but this is, this is the point here. But I'd especially like to thank both my groups um, that I had a chance to lead. And uh, uh, like everyone in, in transit, they were really asked to go above and beyond. And as you heard with Novel Data, which is will be that, uh, JR's group comes out of that as well. Um, but they're uh, asked to go above and beyond, like everyone in transit, uh, also run innovative uh, pilots in, in these past few years. So um, not only not only were they working on something uh, a field that was changing uh, a lot during that time, as Viviana just mentioned, but obviously the world was uh, changing. Um, and as you'll see in the next uh, uh, two demonstrations, uh, uh, these, these projects are now made, um, were designed to uh, make these trip, uh, transit trips easier uh, experience for both the uh, riders and the agencies, but it it takes a lot of work to the ultimate goal is to make it easy uh, both for both these both the riders and the agencies. Uh, so often, what's not appreciated is the work that goes in behind uh, behind that. So um, so while they're making it look easy, I hope what you'll see here is that this this was a lot of work in a difficult uh, difficult time and. Um, I wanted to really acknowledge that and all that work that uh, they've done and those of um, you in the audience, especially who are the, uh, in the uh, grantee class have, have done. Uh, but so we're here for the workshop and the demos. So without further ado, uh, the two uh, demonstrations uh, from uh, ATL and CODA are um, Abby Marinelli is the Transit Funding Manager for the ATL, where she leads transit technology efforts, including the development of ATL rides and production of the Atlanta Regional Zero Emission Fleet Transition Plan. Uh, her background includes travel demand management, uh, modeling, excuse me, uh, air modeling conformity and modeling and performance measures analysis with the Atlanta Regional Commission. She holds her master's in city and regional planning from Georgia Tech. Our other presenter is uh, J.R. Thersenbeel, uh, uh, who grew up in Haiti and speaks four languages. He holds a bachelor's degree in computer sciences and a certificate in cybersecurity. His passion and focus is to transform ideas into reality. Along with his career, he has worked as uh, general manager of the uh, VUS project in a Digicel Group now as and is now a product manager at uh, Central Ohio Transit Authority or CODA. In his spare time, he plays soccer, table tennis, and volunteers in external relations for a nonprofit in the Dominican Republic. Please welcome to our panel, um, Abby Marinelli. Good morning. Um, I'm very excited, like Rudy said, to do a demonstration of uh, ATL Rides. We've been working on this. I think we made the application in 2019, so it's been a long time coming. Um, ATL Rides is the Atlanta region's first multi-agency trip planning app. Um, but the real kicker is that it also provides real-time information. So we, this is the first application. Google, uh, Google Maps doesn't have this. Um, we had a big parallel effort to develop that real-time capacity, uh, and it's now in the app, and we're very, very excited. Um, 
my agency, ATL, is also started right about 2018, 2019. So um, one of the first things that we saw when we created the agency um, was a demand for this kind of an app. So our customers were really telling us, you know, we have a fragmented set of transit agencies. You can see um, the different partner agencies down here in the bottom. Um, and it's really difficult to get across the region. We have a lot of different jurisdictions. We have a lot of counties. They're very small. Um, and so it's hard to plan a trip on transit that is efficient when you're having to go through all of those different agencies. Um, and so ATL Rides was the first initiative that we really undertook, uh, and it's finally come to fruition. We're very, very excited. Um, we partnered with IBI Group to help us develop the app. Um, and then our transit agency partners and our state uh, DOT, GDOT, uh, all feed data into the app to make it run. Um, so like I said, most people compare us to Google Maps, like what can this do that Google Maps can't do? Um, yes, you can plan across agencies. There are multimodal options in Google Maps. Um, there is multiple language support also in Google Maps. Um, but the two things that it doesn't do are automatic fare calculation. So this is taking into account um, you know, the fares that you'll pay on a single agency, and then if there's free transfers between those agencies or not, all of that um, gets calculated by ATL Rides. That information is not available to Google. Um, and then similarly, that uh, we are using the GTMS standard, but it is not yet public. So Google doesn't have access to it. The only uh, application that has that right now is ATL Rides. Um, and so like I said, we hosted a lot of parallel development to get all of our transit agencies up to um, some of them were just getting them up to providing GTFS, like the basic GTFS data. The capacity building um, for that was really important. And then making the transition from basic data to real-time data uh, also took about an 18-month uh, period. A lot of workshop, a lot of hands-on development, that kind of stuff. Um, so we opened for beta testing uh, on March 1st, which is very exciting. So we were delayed a little bit. Um, getting that, we were supposed to do it last summer, but like Rudy said, like the pandemic slowed down a lot of our calendars, things like that. So we have finally opened up for beta testing. We're very excited. Um, Y'all that are on your laptop right now can go to atlrides.com. It's all uh, open. There's no like account creation or anything like that. You can just start planning trips. Um, we're going to do a 90-day period for beta testing and then open up this summer for the public launch. Um, and like we heard earlier, marketing is very important. So we have a, an entire team that's focused just on um, marketing, communication, outreach, getting the word out. Um, it, you know, a lot of people who ride a single transit agency will have that transit agency's app downloaded. They might not understand how ATL Rides is different or what it provides, that kind of stuff. Um, so just a lot of customer education. We've decided this is probably the most important thing to focus on at this point. Um, all right, and so this is ATL Rides. Um, there's two different ways you can access it. Um, this is the desktop browser version. Um, any browser can host to atlrides.com on your desktop or your phone. Uh, we also have a phone app uh, that has a little bit more functionality than the browser version. So um, it's a little bit easier to create an account, set preferences, that kind of stuff. Um, you can do that on the app. It's a little bit easier than you can do just on the browser version. Um, so, as you can see, we've kind of develop, developed it the same way that Google Maps looks. This is based on Open Trip Planner. Um, yeah, sorry about that. Uh, this is based on Open Trip Planner, um, is what's running in the background. Um, and so you can search for a specific point of interest, like I've done here with Emory University, um, or you can search for a specific address. Um, so, 245 Petrie Center Ave is where ATL is located. Um, when you look for a specific address or a specific route, uh, I'm sorry, when you look for a specific trip, you can do it based on addresses, or you can look for a route. So if you know the route that you're interested in, you can just go to that, um, that agency and that uh, route that you're specifically looking for, and you can see all the real-time data. Um, so in this case, the train here was right at, uh, there were several trains being held right at the Decatur station. So um, all of it is, hopefully easy and intuitive to use. We've you know, modeled it on what people are already familiar with. You can see that we've included other rides, including, um, or other modes, including driving, biking, walking. 
right now we're in a period of trying to refine um, the preferences, like the default preferences. So how far are people willing to bike versus how far are they willing to walk to get to a transit stop? Um, all of that is, I mean, it's a little bit of like planner's intuition. We are trying to get survey data to like feed into that. Um, you know, people are probably more willing to bike a longer distance than they are to walk a longer distance to get to transit, that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, so just to point out a couple of key things here. Um, like I said, you can search points of interest or start in locations. Um, one of the things that we wanted to make sure we included were individual preferences. So you can you can toggle on and off mode, right? If you don't own a bike, you don't necessarily want to be suggested a bike trip, that kind of stuff. Um, and then the, the two key pieces that we had developed were um, wheelchair accessibility. So all of our routes are also coded with um, whether the vehicle itself is accessible and then we're also working on a sidewalk network um, to make sure that you can actually get a, you know, a wheelchair or something like that to the bus stop that you're not like having to walk on unpaved roads, that kind of stuff. Um, and then walking distance and speed. So you can set a preference if you um, have limited mobility and you don't want to walk as far, you would rather be on a transit vehicle for longer, you can set that preference to limit the amount that you're walking or to maximize the amount that you're walking, uh, depending on what you are capable of. Um, and then of course, you know, just like any trip you would expect to plan, you get the, the different options for what's available to you, the different routes, the times. Uh, the uh, key piece there though is the real-time information, um, which basically took all of our effort to develop. Um, and you can see, unfortunately, this bus is running four minutes late. Uh, not ideal, but at least you know, that's the key, is that you expect it to be there at 241, but you realize, oh, it's actually gonna be here at 245. Um, so instead of just waiting out there, you actually know when you need to arrive at the bus stop. Uh, there are a couple of other features that were developed as part of Open Trip Planner that we imported in. Um, so for start and end time, this one calculates the fare down at the bottom. This is all done on uh, MARTA. There's no transfers in this route, so it's just a flat 250 fare. Um, we also have, uh, I think it calculates calories burned and uh, your carbon footprint um, is also on there. Um, so like I said, there are two different ways to access it. Right now it is open to everyone, atlrides.com on any browser that you have. Um, and then we are doing a by request only access to the app. Um, so that one is not yet available in the app store. It will be there this summer, um, but right now it is by request. So if anyone does want to request access, please let me know. I will send you, uh, I will send you the link to do that, but you will not be able to find it quite yet in our store. Thank you. And I think we're doing questions at the end. Yeah. 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 Excellent. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me, Rudy and Alvaro. I'm Gio Garcenville. I'm the product manager for Coda. Um, I'm here to present you the IMI project that we have. Uh, we started early 2020 before COVID. Unfortunately, it got paused due to COVID and everything else. Uh, we started back over again around uh, 2021, early 2021. And then that's where we started to have the effort in uh, reaching out to stakeholders and everything and try to get the snowball effect of moving the project forward. Here, I'm here to present your platform that we have developed along with Report, which is a private company that we partnered with in the FTA grant. Um, just to give you an overview, this project success is supposed to rely on the collaboration of uh, different agencies uh, to increase safety, uh, increase the data visibility among agencies, increase the cross-agency collaboration, uh, also improve opportunity efficiencies, and uh, also improve OTP as to improve the public transparency. So uh, these were the success criteria that we have. So here's the platform. How does that work? We do have uh, different counties. This is the workspace for different counties right now, which are on, I'm just going to topple them off. All these regional counties are participating and they're also using the platform actively uh, for different purposes. Uh, so most of them are using for paratransit. They can see from their view how much or how many times that their buses spend across county line 
And with that being said, they can analyze to see how they can improve the service for their region or for their county specifically. So I'm leaving only county, uh, Franklin County for now so I can show you. These are the event types that we have, the different incidents that happens. So if I can, I will just go ahead and click all of them. So now we have the abandoned vehicles, the crash, left on arrival, the breeze, hazard, and so forth uh, that are populating into the platform as, as far as I toggle them on. Uh, below we do have the traffic disruptions, which are road closures, constructions, or special events. Uh, let me elaborate a little bit about the special events are uh, events that are planned event, like whether it's a marathon or something that is occurring in the city, where we have this information, therefore we can plan our buses uh, accordingly. So the, this will show you different events that constructions are planned. And the, one of the good things, which I will touch later on, uh, on the collaborative aspect of this project is that not only that we have the involvement of the police department, we also have the involvement of fire department and emergency ambulances. So I will show you how that functions and all everything else. Um, this one, this is the weather alert. Uh, it only show you the extreme weather alert that are showing in the, I would say in the region, because it will show you a polygon in case that there are floodings or a fire or anything else. Um, I could just toggle that and you can see the different event uh, type that would be selected from there. Unfortunately, I mean, fortunately, there's nothing uh, happening right now. <laughs> so uh, congestions will be irregular or regular. It's like based on the traffic, if you select that, you would have which one that usually happen within rush hour and those event that are not regular ones happening uh, so the crash risk is really interesting. It's where you have a prediction of probability, the probable crashes that might happen along the roadway or the segway itself. So these will be represented just like snakes, but it shows you a three hour window. What uh, the same platform, uh, Record the company, is also sharing that with uh, Nevada. And the way that they use that is that um, they have that with the police where, where the crashes are, the, are probable to happen, they set patrols on the road to have people, to persuade people to slow down. Because uh, they have this information based on connected vehicles on, on top of some algorithm that they have that they can uh, have that probability of crash risk. It's not predictable, <laughs> just for you to know. Um, we do have cameras also, that's, the, that's one of the nice aspects. We do have cameras that are connected to the platform where you can see these cameras populated. They give you a, a view, and they refresh every 15 seconds or less, but we also have access to the live feed of the city. I will show you how everything works once I'm done going through the list. Um, the DMS are the messages that are uh, on these roadways when you go around and let me see if I can find one. And it will tell you messages that are posted into the boards while you're driving on the highway or so forth. So this was also utilized not only by the traffic management center, but also by the police in case they work in coordination. Uh, besides of that, we do have the units which are ambulances or fire uh, department of firefighters on the road. Uh, which also joined the project as well. So if it's a big lift or effort, a collaborative effort among all the stakeholders that we had in the city, so we could have something like that. Uh, not only that we were receiving this information, but we're also receiving, if you look on the left, uh, where it says CAD, this is the computer aid dispatch information. When uh, someone has a crash or anything like that, they call the cops. Uh, and they give their address or the location where is that happening. And from there, they dispatch a police officer to go on scene. When that happened, they input the information in their computer, it's also populated into the app, the location. That gives us access to see uh, where our accident or incident happening. Therefore, we can advise our buses, which is because they are like uh, 40 foot buses, 
it's it's not easy to just reroute them or turn around or turn them around. So we can have someone. Uh, we have someone that is working on that platform actively every day to confirm the incidents, and then that information, whether it's valid or not, it is being communicated to the bus operators. In turn, that will know they design a reroute for them, and they, they can reroute accordingly. So these are the ones, and from here. We do have, on the transit side, we do have the on-demand, demand response of the fixed route. So if I click on the fixed route, then I show the buses, then it's supposed to start populating. Okay, one second. Okay, from now, we do have all the routes just look like a web. I know it's costered and everything, but um, you can see the buses where they're late. This is real time happening right now. Um, you can see the these are the on demand response, and these are the on demand, which has a, a quota plus. But um, the buses, I will try to see if I can find the one in pink, like for this one, is early one minute, and the one in green. It's on time. So we do have them color coded. So uh, when we can look at the map, we know what is happening. Now, the beauty of it is let's say, for example, we go here and we click on the affected services. So if there are any accidents, let's say on this one, it will show you which uh, that is which that is affected, the, the service that is affected, the bus, the roadways. And it will generate the camera, the closest camera around that uh, route itself. So the the traffic operator specialists that we have look at the cameras, work with the traffic management center uh, to communicate whether there's a real incident or accident that happens. And what we have discovered is that average in a week, the traffic management center uses uh, our, app, our application. But in an average a week, they use that one to three times a week to change the traffic signal line based on the incident that happened in the city. Um, we're currently working with, um, as you can see, it's moving. We're currently working with the Columbus Fire Department so they can have our information to integrate into their CAD system, which is the special event, the road uh, uh, constructions, the road closures and constructions, because they are running blind this is something that really baffled me then, to understand that they do not have visibility of road closures on the scene. So sometimes the fire truck would be running into a closure that they did not know that they were there. So they're integrating these uh, data sets into their CAD system that would help them to navigate the city in a more efficient manner. And um, besides of that, the police themselves, they use that to uh, alert uh, other uh, agencies because what happened is that at the beginning of this platform, all agencies work in a silo way, that which their data is silo. Um, they don't share data between each other. But this platform brings everybody on a playing field where everyone can see anything. That's only distributed among, among the agencies and not to the public yet. But uh, so far, these are the main highlights that I have on the platform. Uh, there are way more that I could show such as the data hub, you might have some questions about that. You do have the transit analysis or the incident analysis. The transit analysis, gave, it's a dashboard that gives you uh, how many times your bus on the paratransit uh, world crosses county lines and vice versa. You can select that and it will give you a graph of the mileage and the most time that the trip across counties and everything. And the incident analysis, allow us to the planning department to see how many incidents historically that had happened on a roadway and to plan accordingly on the next for the next year. So what we're doing is that with this platform, instead of acting reactively on incidents or uh, accidents that happens on the roadways, now we're proactively calling our bus operators to tell them, hey, this is what is happening right now. And if you need to reroute, we do that in a process where uh, that is internal to code. So this platform is immensely uh, 
it's immensely uh, great for CODA because of how we can project or plan uh, on, on, a, on a transit map. The incidents, you have the top 40 incidents that you can look for uh, based on your county and, and uh, also based on the numbers that you're looking, whether it's uh, different routes, or wh whichever way that you want to pull out this information and analyze it yourself. Um, these are the main uh, aspects I wanted to show with you guys. I'm not sure now I would leave it for questions. Um, both of these are really great um, demos, and I might say that they both really demonstrate um, the advantages of um, open source software and um, open standards. Um, but the ATL um, app that you developed, that's the second generation of Open Trip Planner 2.0, and I'm not sure if IBI informed you or not, but we were able to replicate what you did very quickly um, in less than a month. Um, we did a heuristic study, and Sound Transit is doing an accessibility study, but that really demonstrates um, the advantages and collaboration of that. And then also, um, you would, that required the FAIR um, standard. Um, you can't have um, multiple FAIRs from that. And then with regards to CODA, we need to talk about that because that data looks very similar, and it'd be interesting to try and plug that into our platform. Just because that's JR, I worked for CODA many years ago, so this, and I talked to you after the, uh, the presentation. Um, question you mentioned you use Columbus City data. Do you use anything from any of the suburbs like Arlington or Westerville or Worth? I mean, you know, to feed into that, and also you mentioned Athens County, which is 75 miles away from Columbus. How do they interact, other than OU is there, you know, with? What's going on in Franklin County? So the first question, um, yes, all the uh, all the agencies or the, I would say the cities into Franklin County are participating. Example, Westerville, like you mentioned, we have the CAT information for from Westerville. We do have that for New Albany, and uh, we do have that for the city of Columbus. We do have it. We're working on Grove City and Gulfport right now to uh, integrate them. And uh, also not mentioning Dublin that is currently being integrated. So all, all of them, after seeing the CAD information from the city of, of Columbus, everybody is, uh, is getting on board right now. Uh, on the second question that you ask about the regional counties, how, do, how much are they engaged or in using the platform? They mostly use it on the data of perspective to analyze how many times that they have their uh, buses crossing county lines. And from that point on, they, the, the county line that they cross the most or they spend the most time, they sit down and have a discussion over how they can improve the passenger experience as a whole. Because every time that one bus leaves to cross the county, that bus is no longer a resource that they can use for the day. So they have to plan accordingly to make sure that they use uh, their buses efficiently and uh, in a manner that they can have, they can serve the public that they they, they have. And I'm glad to hear Westerville was they were ahead of the game years ago when I worked for Bill. So I'm glad you raised the bar. And hi, yeah. we're here. Uh, good morning, Kim Williams with Houston Metro. My question is for Abby. You mentioned that your um, app allows you to see wheelchair-capable vehicles, but is the app itself fully accessible and compliant with ADA? Uh, yes, so that was another key that we um, wanted to develop it. It is compliant. We're working on um, colorblind, actually, right now, so the routes are kind of like randomly colored. Um, so we're working on making sure that it's also accessible for colorblind folks. Um, <coughs> And I don't I kind of glossed over it, but there's also multiple language support in there. Um, so it launches in English as a default, but we also have French, Spanish, uh, Chinese, Vietnamese, and Korean. Um, we have a really large Korean population, especially, uh, and they were a large part of our focus groups. They kept mentioning like it's difficult to um, plan a transit trip in English 
you know, can you please make it in Korean? And so when we got that feedback, we realized that a lot of our transit riders actually don't speak English as a first language. And so making sure that um, providing that information, again, the real time and that seamless trip was also really important. So yeah, the um, wheelchair accessibility and multiple language support were two of our key features. Thank you. And then just a quick comment, uh, the Houston District of Texas, uh, Texas Department of Transportation had a similar project under a different grant. Um, one of the challenges that we're finding is that getting people to switch from Google Maps over to ours. So just want to suggest any tools you can throw at to get people on your app, the better. Um, yeah, that is another thing that we're really we're working on right now is doing a marketing campaign, looking at exactly that question. <laughs> Thanks. Just before, um, as a colorblind rider myself, thank you. <laughs> and then uh, I think what was interesting for for both the uh, questions, there was um, some discussion of expansion and um, a regional focus. So uh, I just wanted to jump in and ask, put you on the spot, just as far as looking forward, what the next what the next steps are, um, the scalability of of the. Uh, these apps. I think you, uh, JR, mentioned it, but also ACL. Um, which you can yep. discuss. Um, yeah, so like I mentioned in the beginning, um, Atlanta is a really fractured area. So in the ATL jurisdiction, we have 13 counties, um, and then of course multiple cities, that kind of thing. The UCA right now touches 20 counties. Um, and so getting all of those people to work together toward one common goal can be really, really difficult. Um, and so we were really excited when we developed the background that that feeds all of the like outward facing app when we developed the um, connected data platform is what we call it um, where we have all of our operators now on the same data standard they're like literally speaking the same language they call all of the stops by exactly the same um, nomenclature so that you know if you if you're looking for five point station it's going to be called five point station it's not five points Marta station or Marta dash five points, you know what I mean? Like just getting them to use exactly the same language is really, really important. Um, and so now that we've built that, that was the heavy lift. And so now we can go out into, you know, like the wider region um, and start developing things. We are actually, we're doing a, um, a kind of like a visioning workshop later on this month with all of our transit operators trying to figure out like what's the next step for the data that we've just built. So um, we're thinking like live signage at stops and stations, things like that. Um, because we now have this data and it's currently you know, just chugging along, what else can we do to make sure that like the entire region is kind of one unified presence, we're not like fragmenting it even farther than it already is. Well, in, in terms of expansion, uh, originally we started targeting 13 region. 13, 13 county in the region. Uh, we currently have nine engaged and seven of them are in the platform as we speak. And uh, I'm not sure if I can show you uh, just briefly. If I were to toggle these, it would border, it would show you way more uh, clustered information. Uh, this will be Union County, Delaware. Uh, you do have Lee King County, Knox, and you have Athen, uh, you have circles uh, pick away Athen and Logan uh, down there. So all of them are using the platform. Some are using more extensively than others. And the idea was to have everyone on the same platform. But as you can probably know, is that smaller agencies do not have the same capacity as uh, uh, Franklin County, for example. Uh, so therefore, they did not use it as much as we would want them to because of, ta of staff or they did not see the real need for them besides of the planning uh, portion of it, which is fine. What we're doing, current, what we're currently doing is building smaller, uh, is building use case for smaller agencies or smaller counties where they can, where we can promote that and they can use it more, uh, more often. And uh, as a sign to show you here, I'm um, see Nate. Nate is the traffic operator, uh, operator uh, specialist that is currently working on a platform to confirm or reject the accidents. So it's live. 
really amazing. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you. I actually have two questions, if that's okay. Um, for, I guess, specifically the first one for the ATR rights, do you have a layer that would incorporate bike parking for people that you know, want to bike to the train station or bus station but don't want to take it with them and or uh, bike share or other uh, things like that? Yes, so the capacity is there in Open Trip Planner um, to layer on uh, bike share. Um, so it's in there, we don't have the data for it yet. Um, and then we're building right now a parking layer. So it's a uh, park and ride, and then specifically like bike parking facilities in addition to car parking facilities. Um, so yes, that is, the capacity is there, and now we're working on populating that with data. Awesome, thank you. And then my second question was, is it possible, or maybe in a future iteration, to do a return trip? So that, you know, like maybe you know, oh, I can make this trip to wherever I need to go, but can I actually get home? Yes, so you can um, look at future scheduled trips. So um, one of the things that we uh, heard back from third shift workers was they can get to work on transit, but they can't get home on transit. Um, so if you're you know, stranded at wherever you work and there's no one to get you home, you're not going to take that transit trip out there in, in the first place. Um, so yes, one of the things that we encourage is if you do make um, an account that will track like common commutes or common destinations, things like that, um, it will push alerts to you saying like, hey, this trip that you've planned in the future, um, like there's a change on that transit route, so it's gonna be closed, you're not gonna be able to make that, you should probably think about an alternate um, outgoing trip because your return trip has been affected. Yeah. Hi, uh, excuse me, I have to have a question. <clears throat> I, I, I'm wondering whether your platform already considered a fair policy? Like, what is a fair structure, and uh, do you have any um, mechanism for the incentive to encourage the user to use your uh, platform? Yeah, so um, we actually started this project also looking at doing a unified fare policy in the region. Um, that was another thing that we heard a lot. There's a lot of friction about literally just finding the routes that go across agencies, but also having multiple media and you know, different fare policies who gets free transfers between which agencies, that kind of thing. Um, so that has been delayed, mostly because um, our main, our largest transit operator, MARTA, is undergoing um, two different fare programs right now. So they're updating to just like a, um, a TAP system, essentially, like it's a media-free system. Um, and they're also looking at like their long-range fare policy, and they've uh, put out an RFP that all the other transit operators have um, essentially agreed to where they're all going to share exactly the same fare system. So the front end and the back end uh, will be identical across all of the different agencies. So that's probably like three to five years down the road. Um, yeah, so our, our fare landscape is like actively changing right now. <laughs> Thank Question for JR. It's really interesting, very unique to integrate all of those different things. But I assume that all the CAD platforms for fire and police and emergency are all proprietary, and I assume the CAD ADL system you use is probably proprietary within sort of fixed route, and you probably have a separate one for the on demand. Uh, how difficult was it to integrate all of those different? You know, exporting all that data into a single platform, and is there any standards that, that apply? Um, I can tell you it was pretty <coughs> exhaustive to get the, the data from public agency. When you're talking about the CAD itself, it's, that has taken us more than a year and a half to get the City of Columbus CAD into this platform. And, uh, but you relating to the technicality of how difficult it is to integrate them into all the CAD information that we receive. We receive specific uh, types, event types, that are not uh, that are not showing up uh, personal information or private information because we have to uh, we have to protect that. But uh, in essence, the information that we receive on the, on to the platform itself, it's mainly filtered information that we agreed upon to receive based on the data that they have. Because if there is a 
there are some events that are not showing or that they will never have on the platform because of the sensitivity of, of this data. Um, the difficulty of it, I think most of it is to have an agreement is to reach the agreement with that agency to receive the data. Uh, applying or integrating the data was not really uh, uh, difficult at all, if that answers your question. Hi, um, Judy Shanley with Easter Seals. Abby, I love the fact that you're including sidewalk accessibility data. So important. I wonder what's the source of that data and is it current and um, real time? Interns. <laughs> Interns are the source of that data. Um, they are, so we work with uh, Georgia Tech and the University, uh, and sorry, Georgia State University. Um, and really, it, I mean, thank God for the interns. They are out there actually like walking the sidewalk and like dropping pins and, you know, here's a crack in the sidewalk, here's where the sidewalk ends. Um, I mean, they just, they ride the, the network all day and they, that's, that's what they do. Um, so there is a little bit of a lag in there. You know, we might have somebody who's out on this particular route and then they don't get out there for another six months. Um, and so in that interim time, you know, the sidewalks can break down or, you know, someone will do a curb cut or something like that. Um, but yeah, it, it is, it is like that. It's just manpower on that one. So it's, um, we, we really, really, really appreciate the work that they do because it is, um, there's there's really just not a good way to collect that data or infer that data. You really just have to see it and know that it's there um, or it's not there in some cases. So yeah, that's uh, an ongoing an ongoing thing. We'll probably have that program going for years. And just to follow up on that, yeah, sorry. is there um, any kind of ability, like how ways you, you're able to say drop mm -hmm. pin and this is a problem now? Is there any way for the customer to, to join in on that? Um, so. A little bit. So we have a story map, um, open source story map project that our planners are developing for exactly that kind of thing. Um, and it, it's looking at uh, sidewalk quality, potholes, um, you know, culverts that get washed out in storms, that kind of stuff. So it's it, it also suffers from the problem that not a lot of people know that it exists, but it's another thing that we're trying to, to push is um, like community supported reporting of that of those kinds of incidents. Yeah, so we haven't um, integrated that like formally or officially into our process, but it is something that we are developing. Okay. Uh, the, the, um, yeah, the question for JR, I think that's a great project. I'm very interested in the uh, road culture uh, data in, um, incorporated into your platform. So I'm wondering uh, where we get the data cities, counties, utility companies, and the second question is, well, do you plan to include the pre-scheduled road closure as well as the emer emergency road closure? Um, my understanding of your question is, are we including uh, road closures? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, right. Um, we currently have, let me show you. Uh, that would be better than Bill. Uh, the special event, the road closures that we have, um, if you see traffic disruption, these are constructions, planned constructions that you can see on the map. If I click on it, it will tell you the start time and the end time. So we do have the planned constructions into that. Also, the road closures, uh, if I can find one. Um, but yes, we do have them. Everything that is planned, we get, we get this data from the city, and that is also integrated into the platform. And uh, also, we do have for special events of anything that is, will be ongoing, such as marathon and so forth, we receive that from a different feed that we integrate that into the platform. I'm not sure if that answers your question. I think Ellie had his hand. Um, I had a question, one question for each of you, a quick one for JR. Um, is I, all this is real time? Do you also, are you using this at all, like historically for planning purposes? And then a question for Abby about um, the, the question about like promoting your app and the fact that there's 
stuff that Google doesn't do, that yours does? Is there any discussion about rather than trying to like come to market with our own thing, maybe trying to get Google to do those other things rather than um, trying to create something that's competing with something that has a very dominant place in the marketplace? So any thoughts on having conversations with like Google and Apple about adding more functionality? Um, yes, so we initially wanted to just do the um, connected data platform to get all the operators on the same GTFS real-time specification and like get you know, that part of it worked out. Um, but the actual integration with Google's API is um, kind of cumbersome and expensive and at the time we didn't really have a good way to um, like do it at a regional level, so maybe our bigger operators could do it, but not our smaller ones, and that wasn't really serving the need that we saw, which was a cohesive and an integrated approach to transit planning. Um, so we decided to do the app route, uh, and one of, the, one of the features that we kind of talked about at the beginning was um, essentially using this app just as the background and then reskinning it for each of the different operators. So they would essentially just stop using the apps that they currently use and then without telling the customer really, start <laughs> using this app instead. So like the customer opens the same app that they've always opened, it just is now using ATL rides in the background. Um, that kind of looks like the way that we're gonna go um, to have a freestanding ATL Rides app and essentially powering all the other agencies with the same background information, um, just you know, reskinned with their agency colors. Um, it, it, it is a challenge though, because getting again all the operators to kind of approach it in the same way when there's just, um, you know, there's political things that are driving it, there's agency capacity to do it, know how, that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, that, it, it's a big struggle right now trying to find out what the like correct unified approach is going to be. Um, but we have started the conversations back up with um, Google and then also integrating Uber and Lyft. Um, but I mean, it's the same same kind of issue. Like, there's just political issues or who wants to get paid or who wants to share what kind of data, that kind of stuff. Um, so at least for now, we decided if we do it ourselves, we can control it and we can get it out there as fast as possible. And then if we can bring in those other partners, um, it'll be better down the line. I guess to answer your question is, are we or will we be using that for planning in the future? That's the question. Great. Um, the platform give us endless opportunities as far as not only seeing, because when you have a fixed route, you do have, uh, when you're monitoring OTP, uh, your on-time performance, there are controllable and non-controllable uh, events. So this platform allows us to record or capture the non-controllable events, such as accidents, such as uh, we, we have the weather alert on this one that tells us if it was extreme snowing, uh, if anything flooding. So these, when you put them in uh, space and time, after one year, you would have a pattern of how can you uh, plan your route more effectively. So yes, we do use that for uh, planning uh, purposes. Uh, I think we have time for one, two questions. So if anyone has any other questions, There was a question earlier about the integration with the emergency management or public safety. And when I saw your live feed on your demo here, it made me think of license plate readers or other technologies that are readily available and used in the context of public safety. And I think you kind of already answered my question, which is it's a matter of those, what data you're sharing and that data sharing agreement. Um, I guess the general question, like what if there's more integration, or I guess, is there an integration between the, the traffic management entities and the public safety emergency management? And what what does the integration of LPRs or other remote sensing technologies, how does that impact what, what you're trying to build here? Um, we're currently trying to leverage 5G as we speak. 
to see how can we use that more effectively because we do have close to more than a dozen camera into our, our, our every single bus and tapping into these uh, outside cameras so you can see the roadways as well besides of the live feed that we have of uh, from the city of Columbus that's that's an idea of thought that we try to explore right now but as far as uh, reading license plates and uh, and anything else that you mentioned about I think the public it's a little bit or could be um, it's a little bit sensitive to say that we're gathering this information even the connected vehicles that we're gathering the speed of vehicles going on speedways or highways um, it's certain information it's limited data that we're gathering so we can uh, have that uh, accident probability risk uh, capacity into the platform itself so um, there are way more coming in into phase two of that platform is not yet uh, completed so um, yes to answer your question I'm not sure if that does or should I go more I mean it opens up a very interesting ethical question right? we don't have time to answer the question. right cool thank you we can work that out over happy hour. I'm sure. That's <laughs> happy hour, right? uh, last uh, question, right next to yes, that. Question for Jr. Have you looked at the effectiveness of the crash prediction layer? Have you compared it to the historical data to see how the damage is? That's a very good question. <laughs> um, to measure the efficacy of that, or how much? To answer your question directly, we have not given the a police department the ability to use that so they could persuade people on the highway as we speak however this is something that we're exploring to understand are uh, how much the predictive aspect what is the percentage is it 90 percent what they predict happens versus 90 versus 20 percent happens um, we don't have that answer yet but the probability shows every three hours and right now we're compiling data. So at the end of uh, uh, the periodic time that we have set to analyze, to see how, how many that happened versus how many that did not happen. Uh, thank you for all your questions. I think uh, we'll wrap it up there. And please join me in uh, thanking the <laughs>